That's a good question. So, I think it's become apparent that it's almost irresistible to teach DNC 10 with DNC 3. Do you agree? Yeah. It's almost, almost irresistible. I was, I was trying to resist the urge, but because of the great question was just that. We ask it again so that uh, our camera audience can, can hear what you just said. Great question as we were just transitioning from DNC 3. Uh, this question was asked. Where's us to DNC 10? Thanks, Bill. How does God go about making sure that things that are important, like what was contained in 116 pages of the manuscript, are not permanently lost, are not frustrated by this. He says the works of God are not frustrated. Yeah. How, does, how is God able to pull that off yeah. in every circumstance? Is yeah. it because he contingency plans everything, or does he have an ability outside of our even conceptualizing to know what's going to happen? Yeah. So good. Such a good question. So Joseph Smith had some thoughts on that. And Elder Maxwell has some thoughts. We might walk away today not feeling fully satisfied with the answers, but at least some thoughts in that direction that I'll share that are super good. So let's let's jump in. So now we haven't even introduced all of Calvary yet, but we're gonna. So context. <laughs> uh, Yerman Thummim will return to Joseph on September 22nd. Uh, uh, between DNC three and ten, uh, Oliver Cowdery arrives. We'll talk more about him in a minute. And uh, the Book of Mormon is uh, on its way to completion, about midway through, after they had gone from, so, so the Book of Lehi, would, it would have gone Book of Lehi to Mosiah, right? So, that, but, so when Oliver Cowdery arrives, they start at Mosiah, they don't start at First Nephi, they start at Mosiah, and they go to Moroni 10. At that point, the question came up, should we retranslate the Book of Lehi. That was what precipitated. That was the question that drew out the saying from Jesus that was that we now know as DNC ten, right? So that's so that that's the context. Simple context. The content, the Lord says, was a cunning plan devised. What was the plan? Can anyone just throw it out? It's ten through twenty six. We won't read all those verses, but I'm assuming this is pretty common knowledge. The plan was someone stole the pages to do what? Alter them. They alter the pages so that Joseph retranslates. Friends, it's again a perfect. Then you would uh, compare, undermine his work because they're different. Perfect. Compare the manuscripts, and they would not read the same. Therefore, gotcha, Joseph. Right. This is a gotcha, Joseph plan. Uh, they said in their hearts, verse 19, we will destroy him. Right. But we will show that he has he has lied in his words. Verse 18 says that he has no gift, that he has no power. So they'd already started with the conclusion in mind. Now they wanted to prove their conclusion, right? Rather than following the evidence where it leads, it's come with your conclusion and amass evidence that supports your conclusion. Not a very genuine way to go about it. truth seeking, right? Who really is going to get it in the end? Who actually does the trap close on? Verse 22 and 26, as you would expect. Satan's actually using them to do what? Verse 22, to lead. Their souls to destruction, right? He's not on their team. He's never on their team. He's never on the side of the people that he's using. In verse 26, he flatters them, he leads them along until he can drag their souls down to hell. And thus he causes them uh, to catch themselves in their own snare. Uh, it's dirty, dirty, dirty Satan. Uh, this was the first major attempt to discredit Joseph Smith, right? It's not going to be the last, right? Uh, in fact, but we, we see an interesting pattern here uh, about why the wicked fight so hard to discredit Joseph Smith. Yeah. Uh, I think this would apply to a lot of the attacks, right? There's a picture of a guy doing a caricature of Joseph and a bunch of women with hearts, you know, trying to uh, malign him with uh, polygamy stuff. But uh, so it goes, the anti-Mormon, anti-Joseph Smith stuff will proliferate from this time on, right? Um, Look at verse 19. I think it's interesting. What's why so much interest in discrediting Joseph? According to verse 19, uh, read that for us, Sarah. Therefore, we will destroy him and also the work. And we will do this that we may not be ashamed in the end, and that we may get glory of the Lord. That is so interesting. Mm -hmm. We will do this that we may not be ashamed in the end. Meaning what? If Joseph's right, then what? We are. Wrong. But we don't want to be wrong. 
And therefore, that we might not be ashamed, we must prove Joseph is the one that's wrong, not us. Again, rather than truth-seeking, it's more of a justification of your own position. Because if Joseph is right, there's a whole lot of people that are they're in trouble. They're in trouble. Um, so that's, that's the vantage point of the human actors. On the other hand, verse 33, from Satan's perspective, verse 33, Thus Satan thinketh to overpower your testimony, Joseph, in this generation, that the work may not come forth in this generation. Well, the work came forth anyway, but Satan continues to try to overpower the testimony of Joseph Smith by those who he has power over, those who uphold his work, as he says in verse 5. And so uh, I don't think it's much more complicated than that. Satan wants to overpower Joseph's testimony, and he uses people who, rather than seeking truth and repentance, try to discredit Joseph Smith because if he's right, they're wrong, and they don't want that. Therefore, Joseph must be the wrong one, and we'll work. I don't know that it's more complicated than that. It would be very hard to leave the church if you didn't believe that Joseph was wrong. Uh, it would be meant that Fawn Brody wrote her biography of Joseph Smith to try to work through this. She was leaving the church. It's like the first major biography uh, of Joseph Smith. And uh, that was part of it. It was part of like working through, like, I got I to gotta somehow discredit Joseph Smith in a, some, a somewhat responsible way. Right? It was kind of a, and then she's not the only one. This happens over and over and over again. Uh, that we may not be ashamed at the end. That's why we fight so hard against Jesus. In, the, in the, preface, the preface of the original Book of Mormon, this is interesting. Uh, here's a copy of it. Uh, do you want to read that for us? Just kidding. Uh, no, but this is what it says. Uh, uh, this is no longer in any of the copies of the Book of Mormon, but the, the first preface, Joseph actually outlines what he learned in the NC-10. Hey, reader, uh, uh, there are evil people that try to destroy me, who have stolen my work. I'm missing 116 pages, the, missing the book of Lehi. Uh, the Lord told me not to translate them again because Satan put it into their hearts to tempt God by altering the words. So if I try it again, then it, it, it just lays out the whole design there. Um, and the Lord said, I'm just not going to let Satan accomplish that design. Therefore, thou shalt translate from the place of Nephi and tells the story. So to be obedient to that, I'm not... Uh, I'm not going to retranslate the plates of Lehi. So that was like an explanation. He felt like he needed the explanation. And maybe there's a subtle, hey, uh, someone out there has the book of Lehi and I would like it back. Right. <laughs> uh, so if you know anyone, well, yeah. <laughs> Contingency plan is, as we learn, in 38 through 45, there is small plates of Nephi, right? 33 or 30, what did I say? 38 through 45. Uh, the Lord says that this actually throws greater views upon the gospel, right? Uh, in verse, where's the greater views? Uh, verse 45, that there's actually more in the original than, or not in the original, in the small place than there was in the book of Lehi in terms of the gospel. So you're going to take this, Joseph, bring this over, and that's going to be that's going to take the place of the book of Lehi, and everything's fine. So just translate that, and then. Yeah. And so, to clarify, Nephi, first and second Nephi, would not have originally been in the Book of Mormon, right? And I knew that the whole time, but I'm just just to clarify that. But that comes to Brian's question: Was this plan A all along, or was this backup plan B, mm. or was the Book of Lehi plan? Or was it a, just a decoy? De <laughs> decoy for Satan and uh, Mormon had to go through that entire writing process for nothing. <laughs> um, not for nothing. Not for nothing. For so the plan A can work, <laughs> right? Uh, so this brings up right the questions about the interplay between God's omniscience and man's agency, right? That's what. How do these two go together? Uh, God's omniscience and man's agency. So I mentioned Joseph Smith's going to take a swing at this. So here's Joseph's swing at this. Uh, Joseph would say, he says this, The great Jehovah contemplated the whole of the events connected with the earth pertaining to the plan of salvation before it rolled into existence. So before there was even, let there be light, he'd already thought through all the events of the earth related to the plan of salvation. 
past, the present, and the future were and are with him, one eternal now. He knew of the depth of iniquity that would be connected with the human family, their weakness, their strength, their power, glory, apostasies, crimes, righteousness, iniquity. He knows the situation of both the living and the dead and has made ample provision for their redemption. I love that phrase, ample provision. Uh, in this particular story, we see the ample provision was the small plates of Nephi uh, for the redemption according to their several circumstances and the laws of the kingdom of God, whether in this world or the world to come. He's already thought through how to save every human soul. And he's made ample provision for that to happen regardless of the circumstances the men, children and find themselves in. That's mind-boggling. That, that past, present, future are one now with, with God. Um, Elder Maxwell, uh, he swung at it this way. He said, since unlike for us enclosed by the veil, things are for God one eternal now, it is to be remembered that for God to foresee is not to cause or even to desire a particular occurrence, but it's to take that occurrence into account beforehand so that divine reckoning folds it into the unfolding purposes of God. And we could add the language of DNC3. That the purpose of God won't be frustrated. Our agency is preserved by the fact that as we approach a given moment, we do not know what our response will be. Meanwhile, God has foreseen what we will do and has taken our decision into account in composite with all other decisions everyone else has made or will make so that his purposes are not frustrated. Uh, so that, that leads to all kinds of interesting questions, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> students, students start answer, asking all kinds of, you know... I think the rub on, on the omniscience of God, which other Maxwell's addressed really well, is how do I still have agency if God already knows everything that I'm going to do? Right? That's the rub. And I think that's a great response to that. I don't know that it's the only response, but it's a great response. Um, but then the Lord doesn't stop there. Look at the end of the NC 10. He actually talks about uh, the prayers of the Nephite prophets. Um, and how God's omniscience took into account the prayers of the Nephite pro prophets beforehand so that his purposes wouldn't be frustrated. So you have verse 46, 47 where he talks about that uh, uh, the small plates. Uh, let's see, he says, All the remainder of this work does contain all those parts of my gospel which my holy prophets, yea, and also my disciples, that's the twelve, right, desired in their prayers should come forth unto this people. And I said unto them that it should be granted unto them according to their faith in their prayers. Like he made a promise with them, that these are going to come forth. 49, this is not all. Their faith in their prayers was that the gospel should be made known also if it were possible that other nations should possess this land, that they would know about the gospel as well. In 52, he mentions their prayers again. According to their faith in their prayers, will I bring this part of my gospel to the knowledge of my people? The only don't bring it to destroy that which they receive, but to build it up. Uh, Elder Maxwell took another swing at um, missions and prayer. And this one blows my mind even more. As to the question asked even by faithful saints such as, if what's going to happen is all set, then why pray? The answer is that God foresees, but he does not compromise our agency. All the outcomes are not, for our purposes, all set. True, God's foreseeing includes our prayers, our fasting, our faith, and the results that will thereby be achieved. But until our mortal actions occur and our decisions are made, things are not all set. The prophet Joseph said the great Jehovah contemplated, quotes that quote, and he says, this contemplation included all our petitions, our prayers. God has taken in, into advance account the petitions and prayers of his people. The time will come when he will, we will thank him for saying no to us with regard to some of our petitions. Happily, God and his omniscience can distinguish between our surface needs, over which we often pray most fervently, and our deep and eternal needs. He can distinguish what we ask for today and place it in relationship with what we need for all eternity. He will bless us according to our everlasting good if we are righteous. I love that he took into account the Nephite prayers. These people prayed in faith. I made a promise. So the small plates were coming for us. So Brian, it sounds like plan A all along was to get these small plates because others had prayed that they would come forth. But how that all interplays in with the omniscience of God and the agency of man, I'll just let you continue to chew on that. But any, any other thought, final thoughts on DNC 10? Kind of a quick overview, but uh, I think the content and context is pretty clear. So. 
Alright, then that is DNC 10.